right, everybody. Good evening. I'm coming to you from my son's bedroom tonight. Uh, welcome to Courtroom Insider. My name is Nate Eaton. Want to make sure we're all here. I just walked in the door from Boise, and I have to tell you, normally I wouldn't be here in my my Everett's bedroom. He's nine. He and Emmy and my other son helped do, choose the decorations for the background on the windowsill, and they definitely wanted the lava lamp and the cat. I'm sure many of you enjoy cats. But we the reason I'm here rather than in another room is we have um our our house is kind of torn up. We decided months ago to do a to do a big project where we had the all the walls painted and all the floors replaced and and to get new furniture and to really just kind of revamp everything. And of course things got delayed up until this week when I've been in Boise. So my wife has been home making all this happen so we have no furniture upstairs in fact i'll show you a photo in just a minute of what when i walked in the house today just what it looked like so that is why i'm here in my son's bedroom hope you don't mind the um temporary setup we threw this together in a couple of minutes just so that i could be live with you you know normally i'd think that we could just wait until monday or sunday night to recap but today was actually an eventful day i was wrong last night when i came on and told you that that we had the pool number. I mean, we did have the pool number, but Judge Boyce wanted to go over and above beyond the required number. So there was much confusion this morning, and I'll tell you all about it as we get going here tonight. Um, so welcome to Jury Selection Day 5. Again, let us know where you're watching from. Hi to all of you all over the world. Tonight, we're going to talk about just what happened. Judge Boyce on day one said we needed 50, but we got to 52 yesterday, so we assume that this morning there'd be like the peremptory strikes, but instead a whole new group walked in. Not the 50, not the 52. So we'll talk about that. Where are we now? What happens next? Also, I just threw in kind of memorable moments that we'll talk about from the prosecution and the defense. And I want to I want you to chime in too if you have had some memorable moments from watching or reading the uh, the notes that I'm putting out uh, along the way. We'll remember JJ and Tylee and Tammy, and of course, I'll answer your questions, and we might, just might, have some special guests who live here at the house, <laughs> depending on what they're doing. They're all upstairs eating Panda Express, so anyway, uh, thanks for being here. I'll show you real quick. When I walked in the house today, just like an hour ago, half hour ago, this is what it looked like. So when I tell you we have no furniture, we don't have any furniture. We sold the couches. We sold the... Um, dining room table it, they were all old or had been given to us and then we're putting up bookshelves there next to the fireplace we're having the fireplace redone so kind of a busy time big props to my wife for and we had carpet in here so we're getting used to the new floors so anyway when i'm done with this I, i'm going to go up and clean and get everything set and drive back to boise in two days okay let's talk about where we are at and uh where we are going from here so as I mentioned yesterday, we needed 50, well, we had 52 jurors. Remember on the very first day, Judge Boy said we needed 50. Why 50? Well, that would allow, once we got to 50, each of the sides to have 16 peremptory strikes. And that would bring the number down to the magical number of 18. So for those of you just tuning in and you're wondering, what do all these numbers mean? Each day this week, at least one group of 16, sometimes two, were brought into the courtroom. They were each questioned. If they passed the questioning, meaning they hadn't watched any media on the case, they were able to serve for eight to 10 weeks, they didn't have any issues, the numbers started to add up out of each of those groups. Judge Boyce said they needed 50 out of all of those groups to uh, then have the pool, and out of those 50, 18 would be picked to serve on the jury. Six would be alternates. 12 would be uh, 12 would be the real jurors. So yesterday we ended with 52. So we thought, at least I thought, and I told you all, and my apologies if I misled, that today the judge would say, okay, we hit our number and uh, we're good. We're, we're gravy. Let's go. But we walked in the courthouse today, ready to go. And a new group of 16 was called. 14 of those showed up. And at the end of the day, we had 57. So why did Judge Boyce do this? Well, that was my question. Like, why 57? 
because now we're way over. How are you going to whittle down that pool? I talked with a few people that that know this stuff, that have done trials before or observed them, and, and they made a good point to me. I, you know, we can't, there's a gag order. We can't talk to the attorneys and get clarification. They're, they're not allowed to talk to us. We're not to, supposed to talk to them. And if we approach them, the judge has said to inform him and we could be in trouble. So I didn't talk to any of them. But, but um, think about if they had 52. And some of those are from Monday. And then they all get called back today or this coming Monday. And four of them say, Judge, I have to be honest. I went home and I read all about the case. I watch Courtroom Insider every night. I watch Netflix. I watch Dateline. I don't, I don't feel comfortable serving on the jury. Well, out of, the, out of the 52, boom, you're down to 48. You need two more. You have to impanel a whole new group of 16 to come in and go through it all over again. So it makes sense that the judge wanted to be super careful just in case there's an issue or someone comes back and maybe their mother died over the weekend or they got horrible gallstones or whatever it might be. He wants to have 57 just to be safe. And he did say at the end of the day today that they have enough, that 57 is it. They're not going to bring in another group of 16 on Monday. So I don't know how we're going to go from that 57 down to the 50. It might be the numbered systems. It might be the last seven that were picked. They can go home or they fill in the gaps. I'm not sure and, and I won't guess. Maybe it's a lottery system where they just say these people don't have to go. Hopefully we'll have an idea come Monday. But speaking of Monday, well, real quick, let me show you who's in the pool. Uh, 57. So there's 27 men, excuse me, 27 women and 30 men. Pretty good balance there, half and half, about half and half. Um, it could be that they, they narrow it down exactly to the 18 and it's nine and nine. And then uh, how Judge Boyce did it in Lori Vallow's case is that out of the 18, they drew six names randomly, six numbers actually. And they said, these are the alternates. And then boom, they were done. It's interesting to see some of the responses to these jurors when they advance. You all can't see it because it's, um, whoops, sorry. It's not being televised to you, but some of them, one man in particular, when they said his number, he just went, oh, he like put his head in his hands and was like, oh, he clearly did not want to do it. And others are probably a little happy. Um, I mean, think about it. Think, you, think about it. If this was in your shoes and Monday you went in and got questioned and you learned, you didn't know the case beforehand. They don't know the case beforehand. You learn though that day that it's Chad Daybell, that there's murder conspiracy to commit murder, that there is insurance fraud, that you're going to see very graphic photos of children who have been killed, autopsy photos, that there's going to be disturbing testimony and that you're going to spend the next eight to 10 weeks of your lives in that courtroom every day. And you can't talk about it with anyone. You can't tell anyone. You can't go home and vent. What are you thinking? Like, I, I get to come home every night and talk with you all about this. I get to call my wife or call other reporters or talk to people, be like, can you believe that moment? These guys can't. The judge said they could tell their spouses or their bosses that, you know, I am a final in the runnings, if you want to call it that way, for the Chad Daybell trial. But they, they can't do more. And it's interesting that some of these jurors, too, said they had night jobs or they planned to work when they got home from court and i get that 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 would probably be me i mean i guess i do work when i get home from court right now but um the and the judge and the prosecutors are very clear to ask each of these jurors like are you sure you'll have the mental capacity to do it if i was on the jury knowing now having sat through one trial I don't think I could go home and work. I think 3.30 would come. I'd be so exhausted. I want to go home at 4 o'clock and just go play golf or go swim laps or go to the gym. Just get away from it. Um, and they've, they've tried to make that clear with some of the jurors that you think you're going to go home and work. Oh, you might want to think again. So on Monday, as I mentioned, uh, 57 or there's 57 in the pool. Come Monday, there will be... 57, all 57 will come back to court. There'll be six, 16 peremptory challenges. As I mentioned, those are challenges that the prosecutor and the defense each get automatically. They don't have to have any reason why they want to kick certain jurors out. They just get to do it. And then at the end of the day, there will be 12 jurors and six alternates. 
And that challenge session goes very quick. In fact, on Monday, court does not start until 10. And we got an email, those of us that reserved a seat. Court will start at 10. We should be done by noon. And that's it for the day. So there will be no opening statements on Monday. They'll pick the jury. And I imagine the judge will say, okay, you final ten, uh, 18, you're it. Go home, gear up. We're going to get started. They'll have to go home and tell their bosses. They'll have to tell their spouses. They'll have to make arrangements if they have a pet they need to take out every day to use the, the bathroom. They'll have to make all those arrangements. That Then the court will have to arrange. Now, in the Vallow case, the jurors did not drive to the courthouse. They drove to an off-site location, and they were transported in two vans. And that's how they got in, and that's how they got out. The court will have to coordinate all of that. They'll have to coordinate lunches if there's dietary preferences. If somebody is vegan or whatever, they'll have to take care of that. So they've got to do all that on Monday, maybe Tuesday, too. Uh, they, the judge has not said when opening statements will be. They, I, I think that they'll likely be Tuesday or probably maybe even Wednesday morning. Um, and that'll give everybody a chance to get settled. But then once that happens, boom, the trial goes. So come Monday, Monday, we'll know who the 18 are, men, women, whatnot. We'll know their numbers. And then it's go time. It's go time. Witnesses will start arriving. Uh, the evidence will be brought in. I mean, it'll, it'll be time to go. So that's where we stand now. I'll still uh, come on here Sunday night. We'll do a courtroom insider to kind of recap what we can expect for the week ahead and all along with every, every day next week. Now, I wanted to uh, quickly tell you, I've, I've sat through five days of this now. I've sat through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight sessions of, let me double check that, of 16 jurors each, I think. Um, one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight. So I have heard the, and maybe you all have too, because we've been brought tele live streaming it on East Idaho news.com. I've heard the prosecutors give their spill and the defense give his spill, John Pryor eight times. And then I have a couple of key takeaways that I want to share with you about what they have said that I remember which is probably what they want the jurors to remember. So first off, if you watched, you probably know these. The prosecutor, they stressed each and every time that they wanted the jurors to be brutally honest. They asked them, what does being brutally honest mean to you? Don't hold back. Then Lindsey Blake and Rob Wood too talked about landing the airplane. They made the point that it, would you get on a flight with a pilot that kind of knows what they're doing or doesn't know what they're doing or a pilot who's able to safely land the plane? Of course, everyone's going to want to get on the plane with a pilot that can land the plane. They compared the jurors to being the pilot, saying, we need you to land the plane. Take this case all the way. Stick with us. Cheesy eggs. <laughs> Probably the one that I'll never forget, which shows you it, it, Lindsay Blake was good at using this analogy. She talked about how she has a two-year-old, and he wants cheesy eggs the exact same way every day. Eggs, milk, cheese, salt, and pepper. If she deviates from the recipe, from the instructions, he gets upset. He wants it done that way. She made the point that even if she knows a better way to make cheesy eggs or a cheaper way or something like that, it still won't work for him. And she told the jurors, you have to follow the instructions exactly, even if you think you know a better way. You have to follow the judge's instruction. There was one session she mixed it up. And she used a cup of coffee. She said, when I make a cup of coffee in the morning, my son knows exactly the order in which I make the cup of coffee. I don't know if that one landed as well with the jurors because she went right back to cheesy eggs. So I will try my hardest to get you the recipe for those cheesy eggs exactly when we're done. We should have Lindsay Blake come on when this is all done and we can all have cheesy eggs. Don't you think? <laughs> It'll be good. Uh, next, she talked about the Super Bowl ring, Kansas City Chiefs. Side note here. Emmy, my daughter, interviewed one of the coaches for the Kansas City Chiefs two or three weeks ago, and he brought his Super Bowl rings with him, and they're awesome. In fact, I want to show you a picture. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, so when she used this analogy, it, it uh, struck home to me. They're heavy. They're heavy rings. But she made the point that if 
the the Super Bowl is happening, then um, you got you get to should every person on the team get a Super Bowl ring? She talks about the Kansas City Chiefs and she says, should every person on the ring get on the team get a Super Bowl ring or just the star players? And of course, everyone, almost everyone said that every person should get a ring. And so she was talking, she was doing this in comparison to um, the fact that in a conspiracy case, even if even if there's some second string football players that never take the field, should they get a Super Bowl ring? Juror said, "Yeah, they were part of the team." She was saying in a conspiracy case, basically, even if there's someone that didn't pull the trigger but they helped plan it, they were part of the team. Are they responsible too? Juror said, "Yes, they are." So good analogy there. Side note: Here are the Super Bowl rings. That's not the Super Bowl rings. Where are the Super Bowl rings? <laughs> I don't know why they're, that's on there. Um, that's bizarre. I'll show you the Super Bowl rings in a minute. Maybe? No, no. Okay. Sorry. I don't know what we'll do. Okay. I'll show you them in a minute. Um, okay. So back to the prosecutors. Also, Super Bowl rings. And then they really made the point, too, when they would do these individual voir dire with each of the uh, jurors questioning, there are no right or wrong answers. And John Pryor made that, that point, too, several times. There are no right or wrong answers. We just want you to be honest. They kept it moving along. I feel that there were many jurors who were 100% completely honest. I mean, we had a young father yesterday who said, I would have a really hard time seeing those photos. We had a, a man yesterday, many of you asked about him. He couldn't get over the conspiracy thing that the whole, that he, he thought that if there was an agreement, it had to be written down. It had to be official, not just talked about. It had to be official. And John Pryor went back and forth with him. And so did the defense, because if someone's, if you, if you have a juror who says, no, they never wrote down that these kids had to be killed or that Tammy Daybell had to die. Well, that's going to create an issue. But he ultimately was able to, to have this explained to him, and he advanced. He's in the final group. Uh, there was a young lady today who adamantly was opposed to the death penalty, said she would never, ever, ever sentence anyone to it, and she was dismissed. So these jurors were completely honest, and um, there were some that just really didn't care. The other thing I observed, that these jurors came from all walks of life. It, it's, it's amazing to me to see, you had CFOs of large companies, you had a software developer for a large company today, you had stay-at-home moms, you had a teacher today who was dismissed because she, if she missed the last two weeks of school, it'd be she'd have to go in on weekends and prepare lesson plans and whatnot for the substitutes, even though she'd get paid, it'd still be a hardship. You had uh, college students, you had grandmothers, you had grandfathers, you had um people that were dressed in nice shirts and ties. You had people dressed in hoodies and sweats. I mean, you really had the wide variety, which is to me really cool. The fact that you get all these people from all walks of life and that's our justice system. And it is a jury of your peers. It is a jury of your peers. Okay. So those were the moments that really stuck out to me from the prosecutors. They had many, but but if I were to narrow it down, the things that I remembered after watching eight of these sessions, Brutally Honest, Land the Airplane, Cheesy Eggs, uh, Super Bowl Ring, and No Right or Wrong Answers. Okay, John Pryor, the defense, he quoted a line from one of his favorite country songs. Now my computer's doing weird things. Let me just refresh this. That all that glitters is not gold. I'm sorry. I I don't know what is going on here. I I I wonder if my laptop is is um doing a little uh refresh because I've been it's not fully charged and it's not plugged into a charger. I was in court all day and got home. So um anyway, I'll just tell you what I remember here and these graphics should come up in just a minute. Um John Pryor talked about the fact that one of the one of his favorite lines to one of his he likes country music and one of the favorite lines he has from one of his favorite country songs is called all or it says all that glitters isn't gold and he asked the jurors what does this mean to you what does this phrase mean to you and they would give answers you know that 
not everything that's shiny and glamorous is not gold. Not everything is it is it as it appears. Um, that you really, you know, need to question shine, shiny objects, I guess. And I think his his analogy, his point was the fact that you can't just believe everything you see. You have to ask questions and you have to investigate and be skeptical of things. And so um, he talked about that. And let me see if I have the graphic here in a minute. That was one of his his memorable lines. You know, another one of his memorable lines, John Pryor got personal. And he talked about his beautiful girlfriend and how he really doesn't deserve her. And she's she um, is beautiful. And um, that, hold on, I think I have it here. There we go. Let me just pull up the graphic. Thank you for being patient here. He talked about his girlfriend and said that um, he doesn't deserve her. Here we go. And that she, um, they've never talked about marriage, but they've talked about their future together. And his whole point with this argument is that if you don't talk about it specifically, is it an agreement? Or is it is that just like implied? And of course they said, well, no, if you never talked about it, you can't ex- expect to be married if you've never talked about it. So he was, I think, trying to prove the point that um, just because they they're together and they're great doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get married. So this might kind of foreshadow the argument he's going to have when it comes to conspiracy during the trial. He did talk about that there will be photos that will make their heart hurt. I thought this was a genuine moment with John Pryor several times with each juror. He sounded very genuine. That there were photos that will make their heart hurt and they have made his heart hurt. And he asked if any of them would have an issue with that. And some of the jurors did. And they raised their red cards. He said, um, though, even though he brings up the fact that there will be photos that make their hearts hurt, how many of those jurors would automatically blame Chad for those photos? And none of them raised their hand. None of them raised their hand. Uh, There were also moments of humor. You know, John Pryor would laugh a little bit. He would say things, trying to be funny, try to inject humor, um, try to humanize himself, I guess, a little bit. Not humanize Chad, really, but that's kind of what where where he was at with it. So those were some moments from the defense that I thought stood out. If you were watching, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Or if you were in the courtroom uh, with me any of these days, I'd love to hear what you thought about other moments that were memorable. Um, you know, the judge was very polite. The judge was very kind. There were some people that couldn't really express themselves about their thoughts. They just, you know... It, it can be intimidating. You walk in, a, I've never done jury duty. I've never done jury duty, but you walk in a courtroom and there's all these words that you don't know. And there's a guy in front of you that's accused of murder and there's a judge and they're asking you questions and you're, you're worried that if you say anything wrong, you could get like arrested or not that you can, but anyway, you can't perjure yourself. So yeah, it can be intimidating, but I thought that um, it went, it went pretty smooth. Okay. There's the Super Bowl rings. So Emmy did not get a Super Bowl rings, but those were the Kansas City Chief rings. That ring on her, the screen right, um, right here, if you can see the mouse. This one, that lid, that top actually comes off like a lid. And those are all, by the way, all real diamonds. They're quite heavy. And you can turn it into a necklace. So she interviewed Porter Ellett. He's the one of the assistant coaches for the Chiefs. And you can watch that interview coming up on Thursday. There's a little plug for Emmy. Um, okay. So before I get to your questions that, that, that's basically a recap of what happened today and where we're at now. I hope that you understand. I, I, I don't think that there's much more to it. If you really want to go through and watch all of the stuff that was said, we have all of the jury selection audio on our YouTube channel and you can go and listen. I I would suggest listening to maybe a little of it and kind of see how the process works, at least here in Idaho, because it's always so fascinating to me that, you know, that you want to be so careful that you get those numbers just right. Uh, Tonight, I'm remembering with you Tammy Daybell. This is Tammy and her sister Samantha at Disneyland. 
From what I am told, they loved Disneyland. I know that Samantha and Jason and their family love Disneyland. I mean, look at her backpack on Samantha. She's got little Mickeys and that that's a prince on her shirt. I don't know which one. Is it maybe from like the Little Mermaid? But they loved going to Disney. They grew up near near Disneyland as children, uh, the, the family. And so they went often. And um, it's interesting that uh, a few weeks after Tammy died, Chad took the children to California with, with Lori. Um, I don't know. I don't recall if they went to Disneyland. I think they went to Knott's Berry Farm or something like that. But anyway, we won't talk about him during this portion. We'll remember Tammy and her love of Disney and the fact that she's no longer here with us. So there we go. Thank you very much. Okay, send in your questions and we will get to them. There's a lot. Oh, hey, I forgot. Thank you, Peggy. Last night, the past few nights, I've talked about CrimeCon a little bit. And many of you have had questions and you've been emailing me a lot about CrimeCon. What is CrimeCon? I want to talk about that just for a second. CrimeCon is... I guess you could say a true crime convention, but it's 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 not as it seems. That sounds weird. Uh, but people from all over the country come and give presentations. For instance, one of the classes is how to spot a liar in seven seconds. One of them is police canine dogs. How do they work? What do they do? One of them is, uh, th- these are just examples of past classes. I've done a session with Larry and Kay Woodcock. When this case two or three years ago, it was amazing. Larry and Kay are just so wonderful. Um, I've done a session on Dior Coons, the missing toddler from our area, on Dylan Rounds, the missing missing farmer. Last year, I interviewed Dylan's mom, Gabby Petito's parents, and uh, David Robinson. They all have missing children. David is black from Arizona. His son is still missing. Candace is from here in Idaho. Her son is still missing. Gabby Petito's daughter obviously we know what happened with them her step parents and her parents were there the the session was called missing white girl syndrome why does the media cover missing white or why does it is why do we assume that the media covers missing white girls more than others really fascinating session there's all sorts of stuff at crime con um and they they don't allow gory costumes they don't allow anything like that uh dateline always does a, a session there Nancy Grace does a session, Court TV's there, Law and Crime, uh, Oxygen. Anyway, I'll, I'll be presenting this year with Summer Shiflet. I don't get paid to do this. None of the presenters get paid. Um, but because many of you were interested, I reached out to them and they said, if you want to go, it's in Nashville this year, and you type in the promo code EATON, E-A-T-O-N, you can get 10% off a standard pass. So... Let me just make sure I got that exactly right. Um, just so many of you were were messaging me about it. And and don't feel obligated to go. Um, yeah, 10% off standard badges. Use the promo code EATON, E-A-T-O-N. CrimeCon is the end of May, May uh, 30th, well, 31st, May 31st, June 1st and 2nd. Right after the verdict, hopefully, will come down. Um and we'll talk about the case for sure. And Erica might be coming with me. Last year, we did CrimeCon Insider, kind of like this together. So we'll do it again. Okay, there's my reminder about CrimeCon. If you didn't get that, you can message me. Now to your questions. Tina, do you think Chad and Lori brainwashed others to help them with their evil plans? I don't know if brainwash is the word, but they obviously had others that were into the group that we learned about at Lori's trial there were several women they'd get together and do these castings castings out of evil spirits they give blessings and say prayers um so you I, I guess it would depend on your your definition of brainwash but there were definitely followers that went along with them Rachel says I understand that because he's privately hired John Pryor does not need to be death penalty certified why did Chad Daybell choose to hire him in the first place and then choose to stay with him even in that hearing where it felt like Judge Boyce asked him directly if he wanted new representation. It seems odd that Chad Daybell would choose to put his entire future in the hands of a single single lawyer with no experience. Are they old friends, college buddies, fellow preppers? Good question, Rachel. They're not old friends. They did not know each other before this case. John Pryor is not a prepper. They did not go to college together. Pryor mentioned today that he went to school, I think, in uh, Missouri, Michigan, Michigan. 
Chad went to BYU. John Pryor's not LDS. Chad is. Um, I think that Pryor was found because in the beginning, Mark Means repped, represented both Lori and Chad, and then he could no longer do that. Mark Means is from the Boise area, Meridian Eagle area. That's where John Pryor practices. I think they were in the same building. And so Means may have, repre- may have recommended Pryor to Chad or vice versa. Um, interesting that no, no one on this side of the state in East Idaho represented them, except <clears throat> in the very beginning, an attorney named Sean Bartholick represented them, but he, he got out pretty quick. And, um, so yeah, I don't know what that says. If attorneys around here were like, we're not going to touch this, <laughs> then they, they probably are glad they did, didn't because of how much time it has taken. Although it makes me wonder if another attorney had been on with Chad, would it have been quicker? As far as Chad, not, I, you're right. I, I mean, as far as Judge Boyce really drilling down to Chad, like, are you sure you want him as your attorney? Think about that, though, if there's an appeal. If Chad comes back and is like, my attorney didn't know what he was doing, which he probably will appeal that because everybody does, that they had insufficient counsel or whatever they call it. But um, the whole thing with Boyce talking to Chad, like, are you sure you want him? And Chad's saying yes. They had it on the record. They know. So that's why. That's why he has him. And, and uh, it, because he's privately retained, he doesn't have to be death penalty qualified. And he's never done a death case. So there we go. Casablanca asks, is there any chance Lori can be called to testify on either side? Can she say no? <coughs> they could call her. I strongly doubt they will. She could get on the stand and waive her Fifth Amendment right. Um, but I doubt we'll be seeing Lori Vallow come into Boise from Arizona to testify in this trial. Three questions from Jackie. Three. We're giving you three. Wow. Since Chad Lawyer is not death penalty lawyer, can this cause an overturn on the outcome if he's found guilty due to an adequate representation? We talked about that a minute ago. Do you ever get nervous talking on camera knowing so many are watching? You know, Jackie, I don't really think about how many people are watching. Maybe in, in the early days when I did TV, uh, live shots were were um, a little nerve wracking. Um, I actually kind of do better, in my opinion, talking like this without a script than when I have to stick to a script because I, I like to be more free flowing. But uh, this is actually quite comfortable for me in a way because I'm sitting in my son's bedroom next to a lava lamp <laughs> or in a hotel room in Boise. Uh, but thank you for asking. That's a good question. Do you have nightmares from this case since you've seen those crime photos? Hmm. I haven't had any nightmares. I have had dreams about this case. I had one two nights ago. I don't remember what it was. I have lost sleep. I truly have lost sleep, especially in the beginning. Um, I have been stressed. I have gained weight. I have. Uh, uh, but so I, I think the attorneys have to, the cops, I mean, look at them. They're much more into it than I am. So yeah, it's, it, t- it takes a toll. Um, I recall the, f- the first time this really hit me, like hit me. The day the kids were found, um, I went out in the helicopter that morning, worked all day trying to get the latest developments. They held a news conference that night in Rexburg where they announced that two bodies had been uh, retrieved or, or found, but they didn't have the IDs. Went home that night and just like, it all like hit me. But it was three or four days later, there was a vigil in Idaho Falls for the kids. And uh, it was put together by Timony, who she runs a cookie, the Cookie Monster Company, and a bunch of strangers. None of them knew JJ and Tylee. And it was a beautiful vigil. I've covered a ton of vigils, a ton of vigils. When I lived in Richmond, I did a vigil like every week from someone who died from a shooting or whatnot. But um, I, a- Emmy, my daughter, came with me. <clears throat> I remember coming home that night and just... It was such an emotional vigil and getting in the shower and just that's when I, I started to cry. So that's like the time where, man, it hit me. Um, but I haven't ha- I haven't had nightmares that I recall. I have those images right here. I have them right here. I, 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 I have them right here. So he's true that they do 
make your heart hurt. After Ch Suzanne says, after Chad and Lori were taken into custody, were they interviewed by the police? And if so, are the interviews available to the public? They immediately lawyered up. Neither one of them talked to the police. And once you ask for an attorney, the police have to stop asking you questions. Police have not talked to them. And I know they want to. The only interview that I'm aware of up until the time they, like they, uh, was maybe the one that I did with them. I don't think they did any others. That wasn't really an interview either. An interview you go back and forth. Do you think Chad would have been a better chance of not being found guilty if the children's deaths, of the children's deaths, if he had not buried them on his property? Well, remember, he's still innocent until proven guilty. But yeah, that, that doesn't help his case. It doesn't help his case that they were 50 feet from his back door. Have you ever considered growing your hair out a little bit longer to have a style rather than a buzz cut? Well, I have, but my hair goes out like a porcupine, like a chia pet. I have thought about it, um, and it's just so easy to do it this way. But if any of you are stylists, and if I grow it out, if you can promise me that I'll look younger and more handsome, then maybe I'll try it. Someone asked, can Lori watch the trial where she is in jail? Uh, I believe she can if the cameras or if the, the TVs are on. Yeah, she, she can. I don't know if she is. I don't know if she'd know how to, that it's happening. I know, I know she knows it's happening. I can confirm that to you. She does know Chad is on trial and she's very interested in it. Can Lori and Ta Chad talk on the phone? Not at the moment. What are your thoughts on John Pryor attacking the media? Well, he kind of went after the media the past few days saying we sensationalize stuff and we do stuff to get clicks and headlines. And, you know, honestly, I, I, I kind of agree with some of his points. We're not all like that, though. But there's probably been times in my career where I've sensationalized things a bit. I, with this case, I hope I have not because there's no need to sensationalize this case. We could have done a story every day for the past four years with some element of this case focusing on the evidence, the text message, whatever. We could have really gone all out. We didn't. In fact, I was close to doing a story a month or two ago, and we debated it in our newsroom, and we decided it was a little bit, what was the news value, and there wasn't much in, in it. Do you personally know Judge Boyce or any of the attorneys? Um, I have never. I may have years ago sat at a at a gone to a banquet where Judge Boyce was there. I don't think he was a judge at the time. I think he was an attorney or he had just been made a judge. And we, I think we sat at the same table or right next to each other, but we, we didn't really talk. Um, and I have never had a conversation with him separate. Now I will tell you his predecessors, um, who served in the in in his seat before I knew both of them in fact one of them was Judge Moss when I was a young reporter I used to go to the courtroom every Monday and cover cases at the end of one day he said young man do what would you like to see my chambers my judge's chambers and I'm like yeah he's like leave your camera here this is off the record he since passed away and he took me back in his office and he showed me like this is how I where I decide a case and it was very nice very educational for for me to see that and then his predecessor, I also knew, Judge Moeller, who's now a Supreme Court justice in Idaho, who um, when he was an attorney, he'd help me with cases. And he was he was very knew the value of working with the media and would advocate often on our behalf on certain things. He did a media training with the with the reporters in Idaho. Judge Moeller did. So I hope to maybe one day, probably when this is over, sit down with Judge Boyce or Talk to him. We'll still cut. We've covered other cases in his courtroom. I have just nothing this big. Oh, and do I know the attorneys? Um, out of all the attorneys, I probably know Rob Wood the best just because he's been in office the longer and he's been in office the longest, but it's not like we're buddies or friends. Um, we don't hang out. Um, <clears throat> I think that a couple, I, I've invited him like to go to a concert, like not with me, but I had extra tickets to a show in Rexburg and I said, Hey, do you want them? And he, he didn't take them, but we've had lunch together a time or two, but it's, 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 it's not like we're friends. Lindsay Blake, I've talked to briefly. Um, I don't, I've never talked to Ingrid, uh, Beatty before. Uh, never actually. I said hi to her the other day and I, Rocky Wixom, I've never spoken with that. I know of John Pryor. I've spoken to a time or two. Remember John Pryor subpoenaed me. 
he sent me a subpoena. So we had to we had to work that out. Um, I know Lori's serving three life the the three life sentences. <coughs> I mean, do I have a water bottle in there on the side of my bag? Emmy is here. She's my she's my assistant. I need a drink. Um, thank you. Dawn says, I know Lori's serving the three life sentences and she's now in Arizona. If Arizona has the death penalty, they do. And she gets it. Would she have to serve the three life sentences first or will the death penalty take over all of it? Um, she won't get the death penalty. It's not a first degree murder case there. So it's not it's not an option there at the moment. They could change the charges. If, she, if it was and she got the death penalty, I think that might overtake Idaho's sentence, but I don't know. But it's, it's not an option right now. Good question, though. Jeanette says, I moved from California to Meridian three years ago. I didn't get a chance to sit in the Boise courtroom to watch Lori Vallow's. I'd really like to obtain a ticket for Chad Daybell. Can you explain how to get a ticket? Good question. I'll show you if my computer works here. Oops. So what you do for any of you that want to go. I'm just going to Google Ada County Courthouse. And then I would do Ada County Courthouse Daybell. There's a page right here, Daybell Trial. I don't know if you can see it. I'll make it big. You scroll down. There's the live stream. Click here for reservation requests. And then you scroll down, but you can only do it 24 hours ahead of the day you want to go. And they only open it at 830. So if you tried to go Monday, the tickets were gone in a minute or two from Monday. But if the if they were any open, you would hit Monday and there would be a box here that you would hit the time, 8 to 5. And then you would fill out your information and then you would hit submit. And then if you get a ticket, they email you within a few hours. It's not an automatic guarantee. So super simple. That's how you do it. Um, and if you're in the Boise area in the next few weeks and you're interested in this, try to come at least for one day or half a day. Uh, it can't, it, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's just as cool to watch it on your phone, but if you come and enjoy it, you, you might, it's, there's something different about being in the courtroom. Amy says his, has there ever been a time that jury selection has taken longer than two weeks? Amy, I learned last night or two nights ago that it took one year to seat a jury in Atlanta for the young thug trial. I don't know much about that case, but there were like 30 defendants, I think. One year. Could you even imagine? So it can take a while. I mean, uh, in Idaho, I don't know the longest it's taken. If... It might take long in Coburger. So there we go. Okay, quick question, quick shout outs, and then a couple more questions. Octavia, thanks for being here. Park Heller, Parker, or Park Heller, Suzanne Kenny, Judy Nichols, Lois Eckley, Tristan Price, Victoria Tabor, Jeff Michaels, Robin Hughes, Maureen Kelly from West Australia, love all you Aussies, and Kimberly M from South Australia. My family and I are thinking of coming to visit you, or at least your country. Uh, quick questions. Do jurors get paid? If so, how much? They do get paid. I will look up right now. It's not much. How much do juries get paid in Idaho? Someone's ringing our doorbell. If it's one of you, then there we go. Okay. By law in Idaho, you are to receive $10 per day of jury served or $5 for a half day. It is taxed from what I've heard. It is taxed. So I think someone was telling me that if the trial goes longer than a certain amount of time, that $10 goes up to like 20 or 30. But I don't see that on here. But yeah, you do get paid if you serve in the jury in Idaho. Okay. Um, real quick, we'll give you a few more. Can anyone honestly really say they haven't watched any media about the case? Uh, I was in Brolem's the other day and no, a few months ago and um, there were two ladies shopping together and I was in Rexburg where this crime happened and I was walking. I was uh, a lady came up to me with her friend and she said, I just want to thank you for covering the Vallow trial, the Daybell trial. And we started to talk and her friend next to her said, 
What are you talking about? This lady lived in Rexburg and had no clue. Had no clue. And her friend said, you don't know about the Vallow trial? She goes, no, what is it? We said, you need to sit down. <laughs> Pull up a chair by the tomatoes. Um, so I think there are a few that really don't know, that really don't know. I, when I've traveled outside of Utah, Idaho, there are, or Arizona, there are a lot that don't know. But of course, you can't pull a jury from there. Anna says, can you please tell the court sound engineer to have them turn the sound up? Anna, we've discussed this with the court. It's the, pro the problem really is a lot with John Pryor, who um, doesn't talk into his microphone. And last question, and then I have some special guests hovering in the background with something that just arrived at the door, maybe from one of you. Where are the Daybell kids now? Um, you, I'm assuming you mean Chad Daybell's kids. I, I, there are a few in Idaho, in Rexburg. There are uh, some in Utah. And uh, last I've heard, they're still supporting their father. Oh, okay. One other, one other thing I have to address. I meant to yesterday. The, what's with the lawyer trying to derail the case? Do you know what that's about? On last Friday night at 1145, an attorney from Mountain Home, Idaho, his name's Terry Ratliff, filed a motion to intervene and continue the case. That means he's a non-party to the, to the, he's not associated with the trial at all. He filed a motion through the I-Court system, which all the attorneys in Idaho have access to, and he asked to have the case continued, meaning stopped, dismissed, or not dismissed, delayed. And he wants to intervene in the case. His motion was full of typos. He didn't even spell motion correctly. Um, and the judge immediately sealed it. Well, on Monday, he sealed it because it was filed late Friday. We know about this because, do you remember when we hired an attorney a few months ago to fight for cameras in the courtroom? She technically became part of the case on some of the filings. And this attorney that filed this motion, she got a copy of it. But she's not allowed to give it to us because the judge immediately ordered it sealed and for it to be non-disseminated, meaning it can't be passed out. So she contacted us at East Idaho News, our attorney, and said, do you know what this is about? We had no clue. She told us the, the name of the attorney. She said it was filed by Terry Ratliff. She said the judge sealed it. She wrote back on behalf of the media and said she didn't feel it was appropriate for it to be sealed, but it is sealed. Now, the judge likely did it because we're on the, it was on the eve of jury selection and suddenly everything would have been upended. I don't know what's in the motion. I don't know why he filed it. I don't know what the re, I don't know anything. That's all we know. The judge said he will hold a hearing on the motion eventually, probably at the end of the trial, but for now it's sealed and that's all we know. I know many of you have questions. <clears throat> but that's what we know. Okay, there we go. Uh, Peggy, thank you so much. Okay, we, ha we have some people that want to say hi. Did you watch this? Yeah, yes, I don't know what this is. No, remember, this is a serious broadcast. Just arrived. There's, there's cords. Um, I think we just lost our signal. I don't know if we're still on. If we're still on, it froze. I don't know if we're still on. Let me check. Hello? Okay, apparently you can hear us. We'll see yes. if you can see us. I think we're frozen. Well, <laughs> I don't think you'll get to see our special guest tonight. But you guys can say hi. I don't hi. know. Right? There, there was a cord here that was tripped. <clears throat> and I'm nervous if I unplug anything, we'll lose everything. So uh. well, I don't know what, what happened there with that cord. But it's frozen and it won't even let me jump to the other thing. So, yeah, you guys want to say hi into the microphone? Hi. That's hi. Everett. Hello. Hi, Mammy. There's Erica and there's someone... <laughs> Someone and then someone just sent us uh, the nice thank you to Stephen Bev. Thank you for your coverage and loaning your husband dad to us. Hope you enjoy these cookies. <laughs> someone sent us a box of crumble cookies. So we'll sit here on audio and the, the, I know that the image is frozen all silly. 
Uh, they're, I'm telling us to be careful what we say because you can hear us, but you can't see us. I guess that's our sign we should log off, but <laughs> we're sorry about that. Anything you want to say, honey? No. I will, I will shut it down there. We are glad to have Nate home, but I'm glad he can do this with you. Okay. It looks like the graphics work. It's just the camera feed. Um, so maybe do you want to unplug that side thing? Or here, maybe if I do this. Okay, so here's how you can stay up to date. I hope you're still with me. You can stay up to date um, by following me on Facebook. There's my Instagram account. There's my X account. And there is my uh, YouTube account. And or there's our East Idaho News YouTube account. We are your number one source for what everything that's happening in the Daybell case. Watch the live stream. It says 8.30 on there, but on Monday it will be 10 a.m., uh, feel free to subscribe, follow, do all that stuff. And the camera shot is still frozen. <laughs> well, okay, everybody. Thank you for being here. Have a great weekend. We will be back here on Sunday night. Well, I'll be in Boise. Taking tomorrow night off. We got to go get furniture and, and clean up the house. And spend time with us. And spend time with the kids, the family. And Sorry that it ended on a bad way. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. That was may or may not have been my fault. I should have warned them about the cameras here, but if I touch anything, I'm worried we'll lose the signal. So I guess we can just talk all night long. The viewership's only going up. They're like, what is happening? Ho hopefully, maybe um, we, maybe the kids' shocking moments still might can clip. Shocking moments. Thank you to, thank you to uh, Everett for letting us use his room. Have a great weekend, everybody. See you Sunday night.